Before I get into the presentation, I just want to make um, a nod to the, uh, the history of physically active learning conferences. It's, it's in its youth. But what's really interesting, a year ago today we held the first conference. And there's a number of people in the audience who thankfully have stayed with us. So we must have done a good job first time, who have come back this year to see the conference again. And this was the conference lineup, so we had the team from Leeds Beckett and a number of speakers from across the UK. That's, that um, conference came together by complete accident. Uh, this time it was Henry uh, Dawling from Solent University, who was coming up to visit myself and Bryn and Ian at Thorner School, and, and said, oh, I'd love to find out what you guys are doing, and uh, me being me, liked turning these things into opportunities. I thought, great, Henry, you can come and do a talk. And then all of a sudden it was Henry plus five or six others. Um, the same thing happened this year, but it was John and GK who got in touch to say, we'd like to come and find out about the work that you guys are doing in Yorkshire. Uh, we can come up on the 18th of October, which didn't click to me until two days ago, it was exactly a year ago. And we've got some more presenters this year. So what's really fantastic, we've got some people back from last year. We've got the BBC Supermovers team and Michael, we've got John and GK, we've got Nicola from Public Health England. So a really, really good lineup alongside some of the Leeds Beckett speakers as well, who also obviously in the good lineup phrase as well. Um, just to say, unfortunately, Jade Morris, who was going to be presenting the last talk today, can't join us. Her dad's not very well, so she's had to uh, to top pass notice. But I'm sure we can extend our presentations out because we do love to talk. So my name is Andy Daly Smith. My sort of specialist interest area is physical activity in schools and predominantly physically active learning. So how do we get children active in lessons through the pedagogical strategies that, that we use? But to put into, I, my job today really is to put the other talks into context of why it's a problem and why we need to start to focus on classroom lessons. So I like an active task. And this is a question for you, so you can stand up, and I want you to show me some shapes to tell me the answer. How many children achieve the 30-minute in-school moderate to vigorous physical activity target? And I'm not moving on to the next slide until everybody in the audience is stood up, so everybody has to participate. Mirror what you see on the screen. <laughs> Stopping me being active. <laughs> I think it's 30. It's 10%. I want to say 10. I think it can't be very high. 1, 2, 3, 2, 1. You think? National one. I can't call it. There's so many people giving different responses. I'm going to go 25% between A, B, C, and D. Thank you very much. You can sit down. Unfortunately, the actual answer is 10%. So in this sample, I win. Of oh, I get this camera. Children, only 10% of the children, on average, are meeting the guidelines. When we look at figures like this, so the academics get really excited when we see figures. But what we tend to do is we focus on the big story. And the big story is how many meet and how many don't meet. But actually what we need to start to understand better is the variability. So if we look on the left hand side, the left hand side is the total sample, so it's the average of all six schools. So the average is 10%. But when we look at the schools individually, so the other six bars, we can see that there's high variation in terms of the amount of physical activity that's taking place inside those schools. So for example, school four, has the highest number of children meeting the guidelines at 25%. Concerningly, schools three and six, not one child met the guidelines. So a highly inactive school. If you go beyond the school data and start to look at the variability inside the school, and this is something that's quite, I would say it's new and starting to come into research, is to understand how far away are we from children hitting those guidelines. So what's the size of the problem? And that's what worries me. So the yellow bar, you know, the yellow part of the bars, is what proportion of the children are getting 20 to 29 minutes. So they need a small amount of investment. And that's another 25%. But actually, when we look at the 10 to 19, so the orange bars, and the less than 10 minutes, which is the red bar, we can see the scale of the problem that we're actually dealing with. So we've got 65% of children who need 10 or more minutes of moderate to vigorous physical activity. 
when we look at the literature on whole school physical activity implementation, the research, the sort of systematic reviews and the meta-analysis which pull all of that research together, they're saying at best we're about three or four minutes in the most effective programs. And that's doing lots of interventions interspersed across the school day. So that variability is feeding into what I think is a really difficult picture. And we're at a time where actually we need some new and clever thinking. And what came out of the recent ISPA conference that a number of us have been at this week was actually we need to draw together research and practice. At the moment, we're working independently of each other. And actually, if we're going to start to solve the problem, we need to work more closely together. So that at Leeds Beckett is one, and I say Leeds Beckett and a number of the other universities that I'll showcase later. That's one of the things that we're really driving, how can we better inform practice and how can practice listen to research to help design interventions that become more effective. So why invest in physical activity? There's a wealth of evidence, but for me this is one of the best papers that pulls it together from uh, Alvarez Bueno in 2017, looking at it, physical activity interventions and effect on academic achievement. And what we've seen in terms of, they are small effects, but across maths, reading, overall scores, and time on task. So physical activity is having a positive influence on the things that matter with teachers. If you're a teacher, which is the most important? This one. Okay? It's your ultimate concern. Is how, do, how do people respond in class? Are they doing what you ask them to do? In terms of the overall school culture, these are the most important. It's about the academic performance of children. With the latest uh, guidance coming out from Ofsted now, obviously the Department of Health, Public Health England, are pushing for the holistic well-being of children, which is really exciting, because I think that is an opportunity for us in terms of physical activity and health to start to have a really positive influence on how we move forward. So when we look inside the school day, so this is the same data that you saw before, and starting to look at what we call segmented school day physical activity patterns. Red is proportion of time is sedentary activity, the orange line is light activity, and the green line is moderate to vigorous. So this green line is your 30 minutes of in-school physical activity. And as you'd expect, we're seeing most moderate to vigorous physical activity coming in break and in lunch. That's where children do the majority of their activity within the school day. Now there is large variability around these, and I'm not complicating the graph and put standard deviations on. But what's really interesting, and as you probably expect, is these three red dots here represent the amount of time children are sedentary during classroom lessons. They're really not moving very much. So, it creates a brilliant opportunity. We're not trying to optimise something like physical education. We're actually replacing a teaching method or modifying a teaching method to become more active. So that's your lesson time sedentary and there's your active. But what was interesting is, we, this is one of the first times that I've seen data like this split out into different classroom periods. When we look at the, um, the segmented day literature, it talks about classroom as time as one entity. So what I wanted to show you today is how we've taken this data forward. So when we look at the moderate to vigorous physical activity, it probably doesn't look that much different in the, uh, in the outcomes. But this pink line shows you there is. Classroom lesson one and two, have the same low level of moderate to vigorous physical activity. In the afternoon, something's going on because there seems to be more activity happening. When we look at light activity, it's the same pattern. There's an increase in light activity. And as you'd expect, if you get the increase in two, you're definitely going to get an increase in sedentary time. <coughs> so when we ran the data, we're like, what, what's going on? Where's this coming from? And what's causing these outcomes? <coughs> So we looked at subject frequency. Luckily, we asked the teachers to do a diary to record um, where, what subjects were delivered, how often they were delivered, and where those subjects took place. And these were the findings. Lesson one, dominated by maths and English. You know what's coming next, don't you? Lesson two, dominated by maths and English. When the kids are knackered and they've lost all their attention, yay, let's teach them everything else. <laughs> so, on the downside, it's a, it's a narrow curriculum. On the upside, we've got great variability in the afternoon, which obviously has wide-ranging pedagogical strategies being used to get the kids more active. 
For us as researchers and practitioners, I think it creates great opportunity in the morning. We can invest in maths and English, we know they're taught a lot of the time, and that's where we need to put physical activity in.